But you know, to form my own style, you know what I did is I started composing, started writing. And that really was able to, if I was able to sit down and write, you know, say an instrumental song and say, oh, well, this is the way I really like it, and, and the kind of the chord structure and the things that I would do, and then going on top of it, forming melodies and things like that, and, and maybe taking solo sections and stuff, that's, that was the best way of getting your own style, mm -hmm. I, I thought, mm -hmm. you know, is when you really do. Because if you, if you play cover, cover tunes, in a cover band, it's great and all, nothing wrong with it, but you know, it's hard to, you got to cop that style right. of whoever you're doing. So probably, you know, really going down that road of, of composing and, and that's how the best way to figure your own style to figure and, out. And when did you start um, uh, really focusing on recording as the medium for your, for your artistry? You know, it was, it was the late 80s mm -hmm. and uh, and I thought, well, you know, what a great way to get into the music industry, because um, you know, at the time I was just coming out of college, and I, I didn't really know anybody really that connected in the music industry. I said, you know what, it, you know, and I like recording. I like, you know, I like the whole tape format and so forth. It'd be a good way to, uh, you know, get in that way. And then you could get to this point. What I always wanted to get to this point, where you have your own studio, you can do your own recordings and so forth, and. And you know, obviously, do records, work for TV, work whatever you like to do. And I think that that was probably you know a, a, a really good education in order to you know to become you know we, back then there was no computers, there was right. there was nothing. It was like today you can go to the corner, the Best Buy, buy a three hundred dollar computer, you get a program, and you, you're off and running. And you know all of this you bypass and you can just start recording directly in the computer and stuff. Back then, you really actually either had to pay for the studio or somehow build one or have a small one and stuff so it was kind of like I wanted to go through that route and learn the whole thing so you know it was a good way to get into the music industry as well you know through uh, and if you're going to be a producer I really felt that you really should know this stuff right, right you know because you wouldn't be able to explain it to an engineer or explain it to a guitarist if you didn't really know how the end result to get it no it gives you a, a depth of knowledge and credibility uh, yeah absolutely with the artists and the technicians as you say yeah that very few people really have that's right yes yeah. it's, it's difficult um, let's just get back a little bit to your style and your solos which i mean are just so tastefully done and, and constructed how, how do you how do you craft your solos and what and you know the thing that we all kind of struggle with over the years as guitarists is how do you know what to leave out as well as to what, what to put in? Put in. You know, it, it's true. And I see guitarists, when I record guitarists here, they, you know, it's like, it's always like one of those things that you keep on recording, keep on recording, keep on recording, and it gets worse. <laughs> it's like the fresh ideas of those first four takes. Right. You know, and then all of a sudden you're kind of rehashing the same ground. I guess, you know, it's one of those things where if you're doing your own music, you kind of know where it goes. I'll tell you, the, the best thing that did for my composition and playing is that in the 90s, I got signed to do um, what, what I considered at the time was, uh, you know, adult contemporary instrumental music, what CD 101 originally was, mm -hmm. um, and then they turned it into smooth jazz and all of that later on. But I did a number of records for them, and I had a, a number of radio hits and stuff, and would tour. But you know what really was good about that is, like, I, I threw away a crutch of just from the rock side or from the overdriven side, and I really had to write melodies that would stand on a clean guitar or, or, or not so dirty of guitar sound. And I, it really had to be structured because you were completely naked that way. Sure. You know, when you were there coming from like, you know, if you were, you know, Steve I or something like that, then all of a sudden it's like, it's just you, the guitarist. And then, you know, you don't have a lot of tricks and stuff to do. And you have to, and that really helped my writing and my playing to understand what was too much and what was too little. Mm -hmm. Because you would know when you heard it back, oh, that's way too much for the, for the song. Or, or, or you could stretch out a little more, you know what I mean? That was what's great about Larry. And Larry told me once, he said that one of the things he learned from Joe Sample from, from the Crusaders was that, you know, to get that hook was the number one thing when you were writing the song. Right. And so, you know, that's, and he's very, he's very true with that, and that's how I, that's how I kind of approached all of that. So, and you know, the melodic side of it has to be still there. It can't just be, you know, shredding and tricks the whole thing. Right. You know, it, it has to, you know, you have to somehow think melodically on it, but still retain your own solos or retain your own sound. Right. 
kind of it's a it's a tricky thing because you have to you have to fool around with it and kind of decide what you feel comfortable with as far as tone and and all that. Tell and that was what's great about writing for TV because you get the diversity of writing. Tell, tell us about that. How did you get? I mean, you're an Emmy Award winner. I mean, how, how did you get involved with writing for TV? You know, I got it. It, it was the same time when in the late '80s I got involved with uh, uh, engineering. And I went to a school in Manhattan, and then I got a job after coming out of there. I got a job going to a jingle house, and from there, you know, you really and and that's another lesson is you you know jingles are like you've got to do this really fast. Right. <laughs> you don't have any right. time to pull right. around. Right. You know, I mean, and you got to interpret. Well, I saw these producers, and they had to interpret guys because you know a lot of the um, the advertising agencies they didn't have designated producer, music producers. They would be like the TV producers who would, you know, are doing the car commercial or the soap commercial. So you got to interpret like what they mean by it. It, it, it sounds too gray. I need it to be more green. You know, sounding. You know, they, they had all these adjectives that you had to, you know, you had to figure out. And and that's another thing about you know I think production is you got to kind of work with these guys because they're not. They don't have the music terminology, so you got to kind of decipher what they what they're feeling, what they mean right. when they say, "Well, you know, this is not you know immediate enough," or you know, and, and, you know, like what is that? You know, so so in, in, in that way, I started uh, to, to kind of like explore avenues of writing for TV, and so I got involved with a number of production companies. One was doing the '92 and '94 Olympics. And um, and they used a, uh, a bunch of my tracks, and then I then I got involved with going um, to these different uh, music production libraries, like Killer Tracks and things. But then I wanted to go to the source, so then I would go right to the shows. So then I would go like to write to MTV's oh, production company, just because instead of just writing for almost like a third person, in between person who's going to shop the stuff, mm -hmm. I would go right to the shows. Um, like now I write for Extra and TMZ and, and All My Children, I did, uh, that's where I got the Emmys and, uh, and I did a lot of MTV uh, theme music and for different films like the first 20 million and The Watcher and you know with that you, when you deal directly with them you get a, a much better feel of what they need and what they... What they and, and you know the music, I mean it's, it's almost a cliche to say it but the music just so dramatically can affect the mood Oh yeah, and the overall color. Oh, absolutely. The overall performance. Yeah, it's very. It, you know, ASCAP did a thing about. You know, they did a test about taking the music out of a show and putting it back in, and and what the dramatic change. Oh, it is it's unbelievable. It's unbelievable. Yeah, I mean, it's almost like it. it's almost like a silent film. Right. You know, right. You get, I mean, people take it for granted almost because it's it's, it's there. to be there. Yeah. But it, it's such a huge huge part of the, of the whole thing. Of the whole, if you if you actually took all the music out of TV, it would be like, I don't think anybody would watch. Right. right. <laughs> you know, because it, it really helps, I think, to propel a scene or to right. propel the commercial or, Everything. you know. Yeah. yeah. Everything. Uh, so, Brian, you've been, you know, very prolific in your, in your composing and your recording. One of the ones that I, I was particularly impressed with in, 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 in researching for this um, is uh, fretwork. Oh yes, your uh, your uh, uh, release last year. The solos are incredible, but they also sound to me uh, very spontaneous. Yeah, you know, I that's one thing I want to do. What I don't like to do, and I always tell guys when we're when we're in the studio and recording, is I don't like prepared solos. I mean, it's it's okay to kind of prepare to know kind of where you're going to go and mm -hmm. so forth. I um, mean, you could also be unprepared the other way, but but you don't want to have. You know, you always know like a kind of a um, probably a, a planned out solo when you listen to it, right. and uh, I, th I my and, and that's the whole thing going back to how many takes you t make. I always like to take for my solos one or two takes. You know, I'll maybe practice a little bit before I record just to get an idea of the key structure and where we're going to go, and obviously how many bars I have and where I can you know kind of propel the ending and, and climax and so forth. But I I like to have that like we. We were live. We just did right. it, you know, and, and 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 that was what's great about the the old records, you know, like the Led Zeppelin records or the Stones. You know that, you know, they weren't in there rehearsing this a hundred times. You know, they were they were writing the songs, and they were just doing the solos, and and what came out was what came out. And I always thought those are the best records, oh. especially you know even with the, with the jazz out of the Crusaders and Larry's stuff. You know, I just I just think that that's. Um, and Larry told me, he said, I never, even to this day, he said he has a Pro Tools rig, but he said, I never do the solos at home. 
in Pro Tools. He goes, I'll do it right live, right in the studio and do it immediately. It's because I'm going to get it there because I want the, obviously, the reaction from the band and the kind of the, uh, you know, the kind of, uh, you know, camaraderie and the feel that you get when you play like live, you the know? The energy. Yeah, the energy. The energy. It's, it's, yeah. Uh, on French uh, fretwork a little bit. What inspired you uh, to do that, and why? What did you invite guest guitarists? What was your thinking there? You know, I wanted to. When I, when I did fretworks, I did. You know, I was really into um, doing something uh, like kind of a guitar tribute to uh, 9/11, mm -hmm. and and I wrote it towards that because I grew up in Manhattan. And I wanted to, you know, uh, I was born and raised there, and I wanted to make sure, you know, kind of I wanted to write something towards it, and then. As I was writing, I was like, wouldn't this be cool if I would just write each song? Like for Frank Gambale, I wrote Spanish Harlem because I thought that would fit him perfect. Mm -hmm. And then Steve Morris with Towers. And, uh, and then Billy Sheehan was, a, was, was, was perfect with Blue, Blue Wind and so forth. Obviously, that's a, that's a Jan Hammer song. But it, it was great just to, I wanted to get the players in on that because I thought having these guests would really kind of like broaden you know the, the kind of the tribute to 9-11 to bring and, and also I thought it would be great to have these players not just picking up tracks but to have them actually play on some brand new tracks. Did you lay down your solos initially and then have them come in? I mean, how did that? How yeah, did that I, I, I cut the drums and, and everything and the bass and the keyboards and all that and guitar parts and my melodies and for the most part my solos and then I had them come in and do um, you know, do either like with Frank, Frank did uh, the melodies with me, so he did harmonies on that, and then he did the solos in between, and we traded solos and stuff. So on that, and then on Steve, I just gave him the last, the, the end of the tower, so he could just fly what Steve Morris does. And, and so, you know, I kind of like, just, I had a, a envision on each guitarist that would come in and do it, so. And that's what I did with, with the new Guitar Masters 3 and 4 with the Les Paul. The first CD is all brand new material besides the two, um, besides the Les Paul and the Jeff Beck track. And I brought, you know, Gary Hoey did El Beco. I thought he'd be a perfect job for that. And he actually wound up opening for Jeff all this year, so for all this, for his tours and stuff. So I thought it was really good, and I thought it was a great kind of, um, uh, you know, tribute to Les. Because, you know, even if somebody doesn't play a Les Paul in particular, I mean, we have all this to thank for less. Of course. You know, I mean, the even... Father the of sound on sound. Yeah. yeah. Oh, my God. And the yeah. things that is amazing that he did on a lathe. Right. He would just... <laughs> he bounced <laughs> lathe to lathe. That was incredible. Right. So let's talk about Guitar Masters. Let's back up uh, for a minute and, and talk about, you know, your inspiration for the original one, one and two. Okay. Yeah. Well, you know what I wanted to do is, uh, going back to the magazine, Guitar Player magazine, with those little records, mm -hmm. I thought, wouldn't it be cool to have a release to have these various songs by these various artists. Now, it could be a country guy, it could be a, a rock guy, it could be a jazz guy, and, I, and that's what I like so much about those little records. It was diversity. Right. It was great. It wasn't their own, we weren't putting all kind of one type of guitarist or one shredder or one jazz guy or anything. I mean, you get Joe Pass one week, one month, and then the following month you could get, you know, Al Demiol, and the following month John Schofield, the following month you get Ingve and right. Van Halen. You know, you'd, you'd, right. you'd have a huge, you know, diversity. Yeah, yeah. And then another month you'd get, you know, Michael Hedges, and you'd get, you know, all these kind of guys. So I thought, I thought, wow, this is, so, I would like to put a CD together, a CD series that would, that would kind of, in that vein, would think about that. So I, I started out just, uh, you know, I didn't know who I could get, you know, and, and how much and how, what, what, you know, what kind of things we were going to get. And I actually was very lucky to get a lot of guys. I got the great track Hair by, uh, by Larry Graham. Wow. Uh, but it was um, uh, Stanley Clark doing it okay. with Joe Satriani. Wow. So I thought, wow, this is, this is, I mean, and also the other thing I wanted to concentrate on is get stuff that was not, you know, it was kind of like what we would call rarity tracks. Right. You know, in the sense that, you know, I got John Paul Jones, he did a solo record called Zoom, and I, I love that record. It's like you could really see where Led Zeppelin got to be Led that Zeppelin. Cat is just so it's amazing. deeply talented. Oh, God. Deeply talented. Unbelievable. Yeah. He, now, talk about a guy who who is probably so underrated. Oh, my God. Well, because he just got overshadowed by those other guys. Yeah, I know. <laughs> yeah. I mean, Plant Page and Bonham. I mean, come on. <laughs> Woo. But he is, whoa, that guy is amazing. Oh, amazing arranger. He's the one who did all, he played, oh, and, you know, he, yeah. he, he did all those keyboards. Yeah. He'd be live, he'd be doing Rhodes, an organ. I mean, he that, was like MVP of that, that band. That Hammond on Since I've Been Loving You. Oh. 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 
I get chills just thinking about it. It's unbelievable. Oh, it's unbelievable. It's unbelievable what he did with that. I mean, just, and also on the first record. Oh. God, what a debut record. I mean, with those three guys, with those four guys, I mean, it's unreal. And he, and he did a lot, and I thought, wow, this is, I, and I put him number one, because uh, I said, yeah, he's got to be, he's got to be there. He's gotta, I mean, because I didn't care so much whether it be a guitarist or a bass player, I just wanted to, Yeah, yeah. Oh, you God. know, it didn't matter. Did that, um, did that Guitar Masters one kind of lay the foundation for the subsequent? Releases? Yes. Okay, so how did, that, how did that all go down? Well, it kind of laid the foundation on that, and then when I got, because on, on two, we did we did kind of the same thing. I would get these different these various tracks, and I would record a few tracks, and then. But what I want, well, what I wanted to do is I wanted to really get new material, write the material, and have guitarists do it. And that's why I started with Fretworks. And then when I did uh, Guitar Masters three and four, a Les Paul dedication. That's the the whole thing is like that. So because I well, with a couple tracks, you know, I licensed, but for the most part, you know, I just wanted to get fresh new material for all I mean, it's hard to know, I mean, each one is so different and so, you know, special, but if you had to highlight two or three of them, you know, uh, on the, the Les Paul tribute, which ones would they be? Um, i said the Gary Howey track is great. I, I really like the way he did the El Be with El Beco, and I, Chris Poland from Megadeth, he did, um, and I wrote that just for him, Tarquinius Maximus, and I, that's, I feel that that's a great one as well. And uh, Hal Lindis, who I always thought was underrated. Dire Straits. Dire Straits. Yeah. He's a great player, and he's he's on uh, he's got several cuts that I put him on. And one of my, I love is the uh, is uh, a track called Betty, and and he's just you know he's so flavorful. You know what I mean? He just he really has a uh, great tone. He has great understanding of like the whole thing. So you know. Uh, Brian, you were um, always. Um associated with Les Pauls and Marshalls. I mean, what? tell us about that. Why do you prefer Les Pauls and what, what kind of axes and, and amps are you using now? Well, you know, I, I um, back in the, in the jazz day when I was doing the jazz stuff, I was actually a Fender guy. I would use a Telecaster, what did the, the reissue, the Paisley one from... I saw uh, actually some footage. I, mean, I think you were playing at a Dallas show. Yes, a Dallas the, show. With the Paisley telecaster. And I said, wow, man, you got a big, fat, bluesy sound out of this. I had that, and I was going through a, um, a twin, uh, and I would put it through a Marshall cabinet. Okay. So I'd get the, you know, more of the beef sound okay. of it. And, and that was great. But you know, when Les Pauls just have, I don't know what it is, an, a, 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 a real solid feel. When you know, you know when you're playing a Les Paul, and uh, and I'm I try, you know, I have a couple of strats and I try them and it's just not the same. You know, they're great and handy, and you know when I'm doing certain things that I need a strat tone and and so forth. But um, yeah, these are one of my favorite, and one of my favorites is Lucille. I picked that up, uh, the BB King black one. It's a 355. Yeah, it's a 355, and basically it's uh, you know, and man, does that have fat tone? And I love it without the F holes. Yeah, is now is the PB King model the only one without the F holes? Yes, and there was only one other one in the eighty, mid eighties. They came out with a three thirty five Studio. Right. And right. that had no F holes. Yeah, I, I have a three fifty five Cherry, and I love it. Yeah, it's great, but, isn't but, it? But it's got the it's got the F holes. Oh, it does have the yeah. F holes, right? Yeah. It's great because you know it, it's like a fat Les Paul. Oh, and <laughs> a lot lighter. A yeah, lot lighter. a lot lighter. Yeah. <laughs> now, how about the gold tops? I mean, you know, you... Yeah, I love the gold. That's a 77 uh, a Deluxe. And I love the Deluxes. They're great. They have um, mini the mini humbugs. And you can put the P P90s in there as well. And I'm forever switching, you know, either P90s or, or mini humbugs. But I think I like the mini humbuggers the best. You know, it's kind of like that Firebird thing. But it's still got the fat less ball. And that's got actually a maple neck on the back, which is pretty unusual. Yeah, that is unusual. You know, and uh, in the mahogany body. And, and it's just great. And you know what? It's so hard to find a Deluxe that was not from the 70s that's not molested. Because a lot of guys didn't like the mini humbuckers after a while, so they routed out for a double. Right. And so, and a lot of them are all cracked right here at the neck, because they fell, and a lot of they're all mahogany necks, and it just snapped. Oh, Brian, you also, uh, I mean, you're, you're using Marshalls, but you have, uh, you have an Ampeg amp switcher. Yeah, I have an Ampeg amp. You know, I, I I love about you know a lot of the amps that I have, I, like this Soldano, that's a great one. It's right. uh, it's a a four ten. It's kind of like a, uh, and this is one that goes to 11. 
<laughs> actually marked it. Soldano actually marked it to 11 wow. on the game side. Wow. And, and a, lot of, you know, a lot of the amps I do is I have a, uh, a switcher over here. And the switcher, I can choose anywhere up to eight or nine amps to go through any cabinet I want. Easy for recording because you can set up, switch to whatever tone you want and go. Uh, as far as amps, I you know I have um, a Super Reverb from the uh, or, yeah Super Blackface. Reverb yep I, I although I, I like so many different amps they're just great you know those Blackface Super Reverbs were oh, red yeah. hot the, that's um, red hot uh, the C Ray Vaughan right yeah exactly that was really yeah. that was yeah, yeah he was Beautiful. hot you oh, very man. diversified I mean, you extremely could rock blues jazz oh it was great country. And they were easy to break up because the 10 speakers. So right. it was like, that's why, you know, Stevie got that such a wonderful tone on our, everything. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. Uh, and you've been very generous with your time. Um, how has your playing evolved over the years? And, you know, for our, for our younger viewers around the world, in, in your view, what's the most important part of developing from good guitars, a decent guitars to a really great one? Like you know, I think that you have to... Um, you know, practice, practice, as, as everybody says, is a practice. But, you know, you can practice in your room forever if you don't take it out. And what I feel that's missing today is intermingle with other musicians. So I think that a guy starting out or just learning, I mean, if he's decent, if he can get everything, you know, he knows his basics and stuff, go out and jam with guys. Play with guys, play live, play as much as you can, because that's where you're really going to get. You know, what, what do they say? It's like, you know, uh, a thousand rehearsals equal one live show or something. You know, it's, and, and I think that's kind of very true. And, and, you know, I know a lot of guys, I know Guitar Hero obviously has brought, uh, which is good, brought a lot of attention to, the, to, to our era right. of guitarists and things because, you know, I guess we're, we're kind of void of any, any new big guitarists. It's funny, I was just talking to a promoter friend of mine and we said the same things, like what happened? to all the new guitars that we used to see on the magazine covers, you know, and it's kind of a void there. You, either we're not finding them or they're not interested. You know, I, you know, there's so much, I tell my wife this, you know, there's so much for a kid to get distracted today. Oh, God, yeah. I mean, if I had all this stuff, I don't know if I'd be, you know, it's just, you're so distracted, you get to, you forget about TV, but you get the internet and every game and possible right. and Xbox 360. Right. And iPad, iPhone, yeah, iPhone everything. bypad, everything. everything. Thousands of apps, you know. Yeah, and thousands of things to do. I mean, you know, just trying to figure out what your number is on your your, your phone, you takes you like half an hour. You know, <laughs> you know, it's just, it's a, it's a, a different world. But I think if guys just sit down and they, and they start looking back, and, and that's what I did, because you know what's funny is when I listened to the guys that I liked, you know, when I was growing up, obviously the uh, uh, Eric Clapton was still king, you know, and it was that, that famous Bolario record from the Blues Breakers. And, if you, and, and guys go back and look at who their, uh, who their heroes uh, were, were heroes of, you know, they could probably find guys, you know. Well, you know, one of the reasons, one of the main reasons we're doing the show, Guitar Shop TV, is to try to pass that on, that, that knowledge yes. that on down to the next generation. As traditional as that sounds, it's very true. It is, so yeah. Mu so many distractions, as you say. Yeah. I mean, you know, it's, I mean, it's important to know, you know, where this all came from. Oh, yeah, absolutely. You need to know, you know like, even if you don't, if you don't care for it, right. if you don't like just it, roots. just the roots and the understanding, right. Right. you know, because I remember, you know, uh, reading an article in the 70s about um, uh, Eric Clapton saying, oh, B.B. King and Freddie King, they're, they're my, and I, yeah, Robert, I went back and I bought those live records or those, you know, B.B. King live and well and, and Freddie King stuff, and I was like, oh, this is amazing. Yeah. Uh, Brian, last question, in terms of your artistry, where do you see yourself the next five, ten years? I mean, I know it's a tough to project out, but where would you like to be? Well, I guess, you know, we, I, I'd like to develop the, uh, the Guitar Master series into something really, you know, mm -hmm. something to establish where people really understand. That's, you know, a lot of, a lot of partial the reason that I did that is to get kids hopefully involved with that. Wow, that's John Paul Jones from Led Zeppelin, or, or wow, that's what Zach Wilde did. You know, with uh, you know, with uh, Randy Coven and Zach. Zach sounds like Greg Allman. You know, and, and and to kind of go back to the roots and see what you know. Probably a lot of guys, a lot of kids like Black Label. Uh, you know, and still love Ozzy, and that's where Zach is. And so, to hear him do that was something different. He's doing I Wish, a, a you know, a Stevie Wonder song. So you know, I just I just that's kind of I wanted to put the quirkiness together through it all and have 
you know, uh, fans listen to their, their, maybe their favorite artists in a different application, different way. Very, very cool. I don't know, maybe a stepping stone for artists to listen to. You know, I talked to Andy Timmons once, and he said to me, he goes, you know, I make no money from this. He goes, I just want somebody maybe one day to find my CD and get, you know, in the bottom of the ocean and find, and find you know, some kind of, uh, you know, inspiration by it. And, you know, and, and that's a really kind of an accurate saying in kind of the world we live, the Lady Gaga world we, we kind of live in today where, you know, it's just like a, a flash in the pan, you get a million downloads and then all of a sudden, you know, on to the next thing. But, you know, it, it, it's, I wanted to give something back, you know, to, you know, to people who were really interested in this well, kind of music. it's a beautiful, precious, and I'm sure it's going to be an, an enduring gift. Oh, thank you. Brian Tarquin, thank you so thank much. You so much. Thank great. you so much. Thank you. Oh, treat. awesome. Thank you. Okay, we are in for a special treat. Brian's going to play a little something. <laughs>